Welcome to Speaking Our Peace, where individuals from around the world share stories of their nonviolent activism in their communities. While we may be far from one another, we are all united on the long road to justice and peace through nonviolence. Today, you'll hear the voices of our reporter Annie and Maya Soatoro Ng. Maya currently works with the United States Institute of Peace, the Obama Foundation, and as the director of the Matsunaga Institute for Peace and Conflict Resolution at the University of Hawaii. She is also an educator with a strong commitment to empowering young people. She shares her thoughts on peace education, reimagining the future, and staying optimistic, even when the road to justice seems endless. master's was in secondary education um, and uh, the teaching of English and and um, I ended up te- you know being very interested in literature of exile and alienation and you know literature from the margins and the peripheries and bringing those stories you know from the shadows to the center and really having um, become so enamored of that when I started teaching um, I ended up working with others to build a school on the Lower East Side of Manhattan and it was an alternative public middle school and we needed social studies teachers so even though I was trained in English literature um, I ended up teaching social studies and working with the New York Historical Society and the um, with the uh, you know, Museo del Barrio and all of these different museums that um, explore culture and community. And then I started working with Facing History in Ourselves and Teaching Tolerance from the Southern Poverty Law Center and Perspectives and Diversity and various organizations that endeavored to bring the flesh and blood, the stories um, back into uh, the social studies so that rather than memorizing a series of facts to regurgitate for a test and then quickly forget, um, you know, it became about it. Well, how can we be more human and humane? How can we find um, opportunities for empathy, for sustained dialogue, for courageous um, movement building, for work on human rights and social justice? And so that sort of became my direction as an educator. And then I moved back to Hawaii from New York City 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. And I um, and I started working uh, at the College of Ed as well as at a high school here. And, and that's the first time I called it peace education. I um, was offered an elective to t- teach an elective. And I said I wanted to teach uh, peace builders. Oh. Um, and, and so I taught that for many years and then taught uh, peace education at the College of Ed. And, and, uh, um, and that's sort of how I entered the stream, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. So you were, so you were actually teaching middle schoolers, high schoolers. Yes. Originally I was a secondary educator and then I just started teaching at the college of ed because having, you know, helped to start the school, I had, I guess, some experience that they thought would be valuable. Yeah. And, and then um, I was getting my PhD and, I became sort of the de facto multicultural ed teacher (laughs) for, I taught, I was a lecturer. I taught five multicultural ed classes. It was a mandatory course. I taught five a semester. Oh (laughs) my gosh. That's, that's pretty intense. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And, um, and, and peace education. And then that was, um, uh, co cross listed with the Matsunaga Institute for Peace and Conflict Resolution across the street at the College of Social Sciences. And then eventually they sort of lured me over, and I spent a few years teaching leadership for social change, history of peace movements, peace education, and conflict management for educators over at the Peace Institute. Huh. Mm-hmm. Was peace education a pretty prominent part of College of Ed at the time, or was it really something that you, you expanded? you know, during your time there? Oh, um, it was non-existent. So it was something I created. Yeah. It was, wow. Yeah. But 
I think that, you know, what they call multicultural education, I just turned into peace education as well. And I think there was some good work that was happening in that space. Um, there were also movements in place-based and, and culturally responsive education, which is often indigenous education and it is inclusive and social justice oriented. So I think there were good things happening in a number of classes. It's just they didn't call it peace education, you know? I find it interesting when you were talking about, you know, teaching English and bringing the voice from the margin into, into more, you know, the center. Um, and I don't think I've heard too many teachers talk about teaching their teaching practice that way. Because I think, you know, the, the prescribed curriculum could be such a heavy burden to carry um, that it's hard to, you know, try to find a little wedge that you can, you can bring in a little piece of what you want to do in there. Certainly, I see that the inventive work that individual teachers are doing, you know, to engage in project-based education, portfolio-based education, place-based education, is really kind of tearing down this notion that education, um, now, I think it's harder for some if you don't have resources. It's very hard if you don't have access to, you know, transportation to take your students out into the community or if you don't have a means to bring meaningful uh, speakers and thought partners into the schools, it becomes more difficult. So I think um, some teachers do end up kind of uh, doing a, a, a curriculum that is very prescribed and, you know, uh, spelled out already in great detail, not leaving room for the discursive and creative elements of education. But I do see amazing things happening. And most importantly, I think a set of standards that is being absorbed to some degree by young people that yeah. their education be more meaningful than it has been you know so what are some of the projects that you're are you still working are you still teaching at the university right now or you're doing some other community more com community projects oh i'm kind of doing a everything um <laughs> i have <laughs> i have um two jobs and three nonprofits. but um, oh my gosh <laughs> 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 which is fun. <laughs> Life is fun. I have a strong sense of um, commitment to the process of um, educating and working with young people of intergenerational um, endeavor. I work uh, always to see young people not simply as vessels to um, be filled, but in fact as really important partners in uh, the work of our building our beloved community. And I think that um, it's imperative that we kind of take the best of the past, the wisdom of, of our elders uh, and uh, the, the uh, most um, enlivened and powerful parts of tradition and wed that with a mindfulness to the present and a future's um, perspective where we can envision a future that is better than the one uh, that uh, uh, would be without our efforts and, and our love and then begin to backwards map and, and to act um, in accordance with and in alignment with the principles that are needed to build that future. And young people are uh, really important, especially in terms of that future's perspective. They sometimes are missing historical context, and that's what we older people can help them with. But um, all of that is to say, I really do not want uh, to ever give up teaching. So I'm still at the university, 25% wow. um, teaching, working with the practicum students and uh, helping them to find projects in the community, but also helping out with um, events that bring community together for say conflict resolution day or constitution day or um, P International Peace Day. And then I am also working with the Obama Foundation as a consultant with two of their projects. One is the Obama Foundation Leaders Asia Pacific, um, which uh, is um, uh, 
underway uh, now with 200 leaders from 33 countries, wow. extraordinary ethical leaders who uh, are embedded in, in the, their communities doing really powerful work um, and uh, doing so um, you know, in a way that is values-based and really connected and collaborative. And then I'm also um, consulting with the Girls Opportunity Alliance, which is focused on global girls' education. And then um, my three nonprofits are, um, uh, the oldest one, I guess, is called Seeds of Peace with a C. And the C represents uh, many of the qualities that we believe will be valuable for um, peace building. So we're looking at um, peace within, peace between, and peace in service to others is sort of the algorithm. And so examples of peace within would be, you know, curiosity and, and um, critical thinking and, um, you know, creativity and peace between would be conflict resolution and, you know, compassion building and uh, peace and service of others would be sort of commitment to um, others and cause and, and uh, community engagement and that sort of thing. And so um, what we do basically is we realize that it's important to um, help people to take action in their community with the resources, the ideas, and the, the passion and the networks that they possess on issues that they feel are important. So we bring together school, community, and family in this 360 approach and um, help them to do peace building um, actions. And we support that with facilitators. We give a lot of tools and resources. We uh, help to um, uplift and help them to feel courageous about sharing uh, so that they take ownership of this sort of peace building identity. And then the second nonprofit is um, called the Institute for Climate and Peace, and that works, as the name suggests, at the intersection of climate and peace. And we work on um, information, collaboration, and policy transformation. ICP is, stands for the Institute for Climate and Peace, but it also stands for information, collaboration, and policy transformation. And so we really noted that um, you know, when we utilize this, the tools of positive peace building in climate space, uh, that people who have been in conflict uh, are able to set uh, down uh, some of their anger and to engage collaboratively for a shared future that is stronger and more resilient. Uh, we also um, noted just more generally that, um, that uh, conflict transformation um, is an essential ingredient for uh, resilience and that when communities come together, when they communicate, when they have um, shared uh, endeavor, when they know one another and feel responsible for one another, that they are more resilient uh, and suffer less uh, in the face of natural disasters, for instance. And so we really see the interplay between those two spaces as being important. and. Um, then the third nonprofit is called the Peace Studio, and that's out of New York. And right now we are in the middle of our hundred offerings of peace. Um, and Peace Studio brings together artists and storytellers and journalists, and um, we basically are endeavoring to use the arts as a means to spotlight peace building in a very multifaceted way and to kind of redefine uh, peace as something that is everyone's responsibility and um, something that everyone can choose to participate in and, and contribute to. And so we have, for instance, our 100 offerings of peace, check out the campaign. And um, at the end of every offering, um, there's an action. And those actions are gonna be more and more robust as the campaign goes on. But the idea is there that so many times the usual peace builders are highlighted. And um, as much as I love Gandhiji and MLK, 
Dante and Mandela. And, you know, there's a lot of incredible work that is happening in every corner of this globe. People who are showing remarkable courage, who are finding avenues and inroads for personal, interpersonal and uh, community peace. And we want to begin to spotlight some of those efforts. And what is necessary for us to build a mo movement is to begin to see, I guess, peace as genuinely multifaceted so that you, whether you are an entrepreneur or a physician, whether you work in public health or in education, whether you are young or indeed very, very old, that you have a way to enter the stream, you have a way to participate, that there's so much that you can do. If you begin to see peace building as part of your everyday work, regardless of your profession and position. The U.S. is probably not the most peaceful place right now. <laughs> like, how do you keep just the momentum going, and just how do you keep the, the optimism in in you know uh, all this activism and all this peace work that you do? Well, I am fortunate to work with young people and to have that as a central mission. And young people really get it. They're very inclusive. They know climate change is real. They have a desire to cast in it wide and they don't um, uh, accept as readily that things are the way they are uh, inevitably. And they really see the possibilities of conflict transformation and they help me to retain a sense of optimism. But also the emphasis of action in all of these initiatives is very helpful. If I um, start feeling despondent about climate change, but then I am working with the community to think about how we can help um, farmers and increase food sustainability, if I am bringing together, um, you know, communities from the Compact of Free Association and in Micronesians with Hawaiians and thinking about um, how we can uh, engage in different definitions of hospitality. If I'm looking at, um, you know, be building um, uh, better uh, urban spaces that are more sustainable. If I am in schools talking about personal choices and the ways that we can impact or, you know, how to push policy and all of those uh, endeavors, um, I'm not you know, working to save the world, I'm working to save myself and to retain a sense <laughs> of optimism because I can see that there's so much that we can do. And even if I don't have the climate science, for instance, that is needed to um, invent mechanisms for carbon capture, I can still do a great deal uh, to uh, feel um, empowered and to feel as though I am making a contribution. Yeah, and I think I like your idea of also when you work with younger people, it helps you extend your horizon much further than, you know, what, yes. what you can see in front of yourself, right? Most assuredly. And young people are um, not set in their ways. And so you begin to dismantle or, or untangle this sense of despair that may come from seeing leadership behave badly or recognizing the um, circular patterns of violence. You know, you start um, saying to yourself, this isn't inevitable. I call that uh, the washing of the eyes. Uh, Tuchi mata is an Indonesian phrase that I utilize, but I think that, um, it, you know, it refers in my usage to the fact that we can always refresh our gaze about what is possible, you know, about our own responsibility, about this time in history, something that feels bad 
Uh, we can engage robust silver lining thinking that is meaningful and not Pollyanna to discover what is good. So during the COVID situation, many people said, okay, this is a time to slow down. Maybe we can give access to people who didn't have the mobility before, the capacity to travel. Maybe this is an opportunity uh, to um, reinvest in a different kind of economy. Maybe this is an opportunity for us to recognize the digital divide and, and health disparities and recommit to improving or changing those situations. So, you know, every um, moment in our personal and collective histories is an opportunity to, I think, reinvent um, not just ourselves, but uh, our spaces and um, our potential for the future. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I think it's, I, I, I like what you're saying that if we stop seeing the, you know, the way or the, the pessimistic version of the future being, we stop seeing it as, you know, inevitable, then I think there's a lot of things that we could do. Um, however small they might look like, you know, right now, but they do add up. And I think I always like the Jajagat stuff that you see, you see people in their village working together within, it looks like it's just within the village, but it just, you know, the next door village might do something and it just expands from there. It's not really just one person. Yes, absolutely. Um, I really love the inclusive nature of that, this notion of, you know, um, coming together um, through uh, this long walk that is both metaphorical and when possible physical, um, really to me is a very definition of courage. I used to define courage as a leap uh, into the unknown and, you know, like skydiving. And now I feel like courage is about us going down this long road, taking this long walk, um, when we're thirsty, when we're hungry, when we don't know where we're gonna get our next meal, when we don't know when we're gonna get rest, when we don't know what the destination is gonna be, but we welcome and embrace strangers and turn them into family and we walk ahead and persist. And you know, when we're looking at peace building, we see um, and you know, the project of nonviolence itself, it's a long project and it requires the changing of hearts and minds. Sometimes over generations, it requires that we develop a sense of courage that is holistic and that is um, about leaning into our discomfort, being a, 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 a customizing ourselves to uh, uncertainty and um, turning um, a, a stranger into a friend and fear into um, you know into determination. <laughs> and uh, so I think like the whole, um, Jay Jagat um, March, for instance, and the, the vision itself um, is, of course, a testament to the beauty and the um, bounty of um, uh, Gandhiji, but it is also, and, and, and the work of, of the past, but it is also, I believe, um, about finding um, sort of the next iterations, new voices for um, peace building leadership um, and uh, requiring a redefinition of courage and and a reimagination of the power of nonviolence for uh, the present and the future. I think about um, how so many of the, the bad things that are happening today in the U.S. and in the world uh, stem from uh, the same. Uh, set of problems and fears and um, uh, limitations and, and narrowness that Gandhiji himself faced. And you sort of see, oh gosh, when it comes to uh, racism and ethnic exclusion and um, these inequities and the kind of stereotyping and uh, the kind of div divisiveness and us them that you sort of wonder have we not 
gotten over this? Have we not figured this out? Have we not uh, developed a series of permanent solutions? And, and the answer is, unfortunately, that we have to reinvest and, and rebuild um, a better vision and set of solutions again and again, I think. And so we will find that some of um, Gandhi's uh, practices are useful, but we have to layer and, and scaffold, I think, upon them and, and find uh, voices that uh, can kind of take us uh, through the leadership of um, whether it's song or protest or uh, innovation down uh, new pathways. And it's exciting uh, and it's uh, terrifying and it's exhausting, but it's good work. <laughs> I think it could be very satisfying work, right? Yes, <laughs> I think so. I mean, I feel like um, there is no satisfaction in um, despondence. And I think that despair is uh, something that we should avoid at all costs in spite of all that is going on and the messy um, experiment of whether it's nation building or, <laughs> or community <laughs> engagement is something that we can't give up on. And uh, although we have to courageously critique it and demand more of our leaders, I also think that um, optimism is so important and it is meaningful work. And it, I feel like it, if we can, at the end of our days, look back on, on our commitments and, um, in nonviolent social change, uh, we will all feel, I think, a sense of peace. There is, um, I think, great uh, power in resilience, mm -hmm. too. And I say resilience is our resistance at this time. That's a great we line. Are, <laughs> yeah, we are stronger than we know. This is our time to... Um, fortify ourselves and in part we do so by recognizing one another and by extending invitations um, to others to join us in this good work and and um, wherever we are there is a point of entry that um, signals new possibilities and when I look at your wonderful face and I uh, see my students or I um, have conversations with my uh, earnest and thoughtful daughters, I really uh, feel resilient and, and um, feel grateful for, um, you know, the, the, the incredibly powerful, beautiful layering of lives that um, is taking place now. You know, wherever you are, you can now blog, vlog, you can do podcasts, you can um, self-publish, you can you know, engage positively on social media. You can um, harness the power of uh, possibility and community, and you don't have to have a position of leadership. You don't have to have a lot in the way of resources. You don't have to um, be of a particular age. So that is pretty cool. Has it been easy to talk to people about nonviolence and peace? I sometimes get people who are dismissive of it a little bit. Um, and some of them are people with good intentions who, you know, treat 
peace building as a nice utopic idea that will never come to fruition. And, um, but how sweet, you know, pat pat on the head. Uh, or, um, and I think that that is because we have a need to reframe and redefine and reimagine peace to make it understood as really uh, pragmatic and action oriented. And I think that too often people are dismissive of it, thinking of it as simply a utopian ideal or, or you know, seeing it as kind of um, a relic of, you know, hippies or uh, new age um, uh, exploration, which with all due respect, tends to be a little self-indulgent, you know? I think that if we begin to see peace building instead as about uh, rigorously and vigorously working every day to improve our communities and the lives of people in it, then it takes on a different dimension. And I think that that's the way we should be talking about it, which means that we need to be careful of having peace be put into, uh, you know, boxes. And so I, I for instance, feel very wary of um, some expressions of, you know, personal peace that use words like transcendence or, um, you know, and not because I don't think that um, there is such a thing as transcendence, because I, I do, I do. I think that we can um, move beyond our own suffering and sorrow and that, you know, the, the important work of meditation and mindfulness and uh, reconnection with uh, the energy of nature and ecosystem, you know, that can lead to transcendence. But it's just that words like that, when used, um, make it easier for people to dismiss peace builders as um, uh, workers who make our world better, more fair, more just, more humane and more righteous, you know? So I just, um, I think that uh, sometimes it is difficult, but um, it's. Yeah. And I think I find it, I mean, just um, within my own circle, I find it probably most difficult when when you know people see that the world's falling apart and so it's like well i'm just going to cocoon myself and make sure that i'm okay that my family's okay and just basically like you know i can't do with anything else and it becomes a so um i mean in that sense it's just kind of retreating within yourself as opposed to you know seeing yourself as part of a much bigger you know universe right 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 and I mean, I, I uh, do uh, uh, feel like during times like this, we do have to think about self-care and we do have to right. think about, you know, mindfulness and, and reflection and, and uh, make sure that um, we have that personal resilience. But I really also think that um, what you say is important in so far as we have to think about ourselves always as part of a larger experience. We are threads in a really complex tapestry. And let us not say that we are bored when there is so much work to do, you know? <laughs> Thanks for listening and walking with us on our long march. We believe that all actions taken towards justice are meaningful and powerful. So go out in your community and do good work. You'll be in good company. Speaking Our Peace is produced by Annie Luck, Beshima Vishnoi, Priya Joshi, and Reva Joshi. We can be reached by email at speakingourpeace at gmail.com. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Our Peace Podcast. Our music is made by Sunbear. Until next time.